Good evening, everyone, and welcome to our Emerson Week event on the reemergence of community journalism with our special guests, journalist Soledad O'Brien and Rose Arce. My name is Raul Reis, and I have the honor of serving as the Dean of the School of Communication. Community journalism has been a part of our journalism program here at Emerson for a long time. But the department and its faculty have been focusing more and more on this topic in the past several years. With the triple threat of the COVID pandemic and the economic and racial injustice crisis, community journalism has become even more urgent and necessary than ever. So it is my pleasure to introduce to you our amazing journalism department chair, Professor Janet Colozzi who will be talking more about these connections and introducing our speakers tonight. Professor Colozzi brought more than two decades of professional journalism experience in print and broadcast news to her teaching and research here at Emerson. Before coming to Emerson in 1998, she was a reporter, writer, and producer, including serving as senior writer and editor as CNN International, senior producer as CNN World Report, and assistant state editor at the Cleveland Plain Dealer. Janet. Thank you, Raul, and uh, thank you, Dean Rice. Um, joining us tonight are two incredibly accomplished journalists who are continuing to break new pathways for their reporting and producing. Soledad O'Brien is a driving force as founder and CEO of Soledad O'Brien Productions, a regular contributor to Real Sports on HBO and the PBS NewsHour and WebMD, and there's so many. She's also anchor and producer of the Hearst Television uh, political program, Matter of Fact, with Soledad O'Brien, as well as in her not too distant past, reporter and anchor for CNN, NBC and MSNBC. <laughs> and I, she is also in with, with her executive producer, Rose Arce, who I will introduce in a, about a half second, are continually working on specials and new, new ways in which stories need and are being told. Um, among sold as awards, and then there, there are numerous of them, we're just gonna outline three Emmys, a Peabody and a DuPont. Uh, whoa, <laughs> that's, that's pretty cool. Rose Arce, who is the executive producer at Soledad Produ at, uh, Productions, has worked as that executive producer for more than seven years, but she also is extremely accomplished and award-winning. Um, and if there's a theme here, she's also um, someone who worked at CNN on both the domestic and the international fronts. Gee, uh, with th three and uh, CNN alums here. Um, but she was also a producer at CBS News and at WCBS, winning an Emmy at WCBS. And when she was a print reporter, this is again, something like Rose, we, we have way too much in common. She was also was, has won a Pulitzer as a senior writer at Newsday. So working in both uh, broadcast and print and now, you know, in new ways and new pathways. In addition to producing series and documentaries, these two women also have just written two books together, Latino in America and My Journey Through the Land of Possibilities. So yes, <laughs> they've got a lot of stuff under their belt. And that's why I think having them here is going to help us have what I call a robust conversation on changing journalism that reimagines some of the basic ways journalism helps the public understand what is going on in their communities. This community journalism focus, as, as Dean Rice mentioned, is an exciting and dynam dynamic area of growth for all of us. All right, I'm going to I'm going to put the little the negativity here because there's always so much that journalists have to bring up about it. But I don't need to basically tell all of you here listening that it's been a it's been a tough year. The pandemic, the fight for social justice, political polarization, those have all demonstrated the need for journalism is greater than ever. But however, we also know the other side of that coin is trust in how journalism operates is not, it's at its worst. A recent American Press Institute study shows journalists and their public can't even agree on the core values that guide what we do. 
So that sounds like horrible, awful. How are we going to deal with that? Well, quite honestly, we know how to deal with that. And one of the things is trying to figure out to, to, to make this, take the lessons from what we know and turning that in ways to make it better. So we have learned that what we've always known is we need to get into the community. We need to talk to people, not just at them. We need to seek information about solutions and not just report about their problems. It's not just journalism about a community, it's also in a community and maybe even with a community. This all points out to how we can shape the future of journalism. And here's my little plug for the department. We've been doing this and, and, and plan to continue doing this. I will point out Gina Canella's grassroots journalism with the Somerville News Garden and Cindy Rodriguez Urban Affairs reporting with the Bay State Banner. We cr let's create some partnerships. Let's figure out how we can do this. And the journalism that Soledad and Rose do gets us in communities that are taking action facing environmental hazards, destruction via gentrification and health issues. Most of these stories have been part of a BET series called Disrupt and Dismantle. And so with that, I'm going to allow us to take a quick look at the trailer for that. And then we're going to talk and I'll introduce some of the, the uh, stories that they've done. Whoa. America has a systemic racism problem. I'm going out to meet real people with real problems. You're not going to the problems. The problems are coming to you now. The children are literally fighting for survival, fighting for their lives. You're a target, you know. Most kids don't see 18. Black and brown kids are disproportionately arrested. So what are you going to do? And uh, when? Good question. We smell chemicals. We inhale chemicals. It's, it's unbearable. Shingle Mountain was illegal from day one. Well, you got to be careful. You really fight for my life. We live in a world and a society where the color of my skin determines whether or not I get to be treated like a human. You honestly don't believe that anything was done wrong? No. All this property used to be owned by black people. We should be able to live here in peace. It's a hostile takeover. They don't care, and it's because of the color of our skin. A simple sonogram could have saved my son's life. How does race intersect with this? Race intersects with everything in Mississippi. Standing by is no longer an option. If the system is fixed, how do we fix these system issues? Who's fighting back? Attacking the issues head on and making it right, not taking no Disrupt and dismantle. Now, if that hasn't piqued your interest, we do have the first story that we're going to take a look at. And I just love the name of it because it's called Shingle Mountain, which basically just describes what literally is in this suburban almost. It's the, you know, there, there are horses and, and, and fields that these people moved into this neighborhood to live in to then find Shingle Mountain. This first story shows us a black community that truly represents what has just come out in a study last week, which is the disproportionate impact of toxic pollution on Americans of color. And you just sit there going like, this is, is this really America? And then guess what? This is America and in fact, what is often that issue is that the community, the people in that community are doing something and are really trying to make a change. So I'm going to, I hope that is again, very interesting for you. Let's look at this excerpt. This picture perfect home in the country is where 62 year old Marsha Jackson lives on a quiet, dead-end street in a neighborhood called Floral Farms, about nine miles south of downtown Dallas. Marcia lives with her adorable granddaughter, Courtney, and her daughter, Lakeisha. When I first moved here in um, 1995, <laughs> I moved here September 1995. 
I found this house because my daughter's rodeo having horses and agriculture that was allowed here. I was just thought, oh wow. The girls had the horses right here and they can just go out and ride. When we first moved here, it was just like a country. We called it the country in the city. We have a lot of land, so we would just run around. I would ride my bike up and down the street. People just like to sit out and barbecue, just enjoy ourselves. But you know, all that has changed now. Their lives changed when trucks started pulling up and dumping shingles on the lot next door. The shingles started almost three years ago now. You'll hear the trucks and then you'll see particles and stuff in the, in the air flying around. They started getting taller and taller, and it started making us sick. And I apologize, because as I talk, my voice will start going away until I catch back up. And that's just uh, some of that inflammation that I have been um, dealing with. The mound grew so tall, locals started calling it Shingle Mountain. Oh my gosh. Holy cow, that's a mountain. She was not exaggerating. Hi, Marsha. I'm so dead. Hi. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you also. I figure we can take our masks off if we stay the okay. six feet apart from each other. Are okay. you fine with yeah, that? I am. It's a big space. It goes on for a long yeah. way. It's big. It does. Hey, Keisha. Hey, girl. Hey, camera. Hey. <laughs> Why did you want to move to this neighborhood all those many years ago? I moved here 25 years ago because of this, to be able to come outside, enjoy ourselves, enjoy our horses, enjoy our animals, and just live country living. You know, and that has changed drastically. It's kind of surprising how beautiful it is looking this direction. I mean, this is the country. But if you just turn like 180 degrees that way. That's a mess. That's a mess. It's terrible. They shingle mountain. Let's get a closer look at it. Look at it. Shingle mountain. Wow. That's 100,000 tons of shingles. 100,000 yes. tons of shingles? Exactly. Wow. It kind of smells like like just rubber, like raw rubber. It does, it smells like burnt pavement. A lot of violations. Yeah, excuse Bless me. You. Yeah. Bless you. Yeah. I think I I'm feeling all this back dust. <laughs> yes, that's what we're yeah, doing. Yeah, you can feel it going up your yeah. nose. Mm-hmm, yeah, hmm. you can just extra feel it. On the mountain. Yeah, excuse me. Bless you. And I have good and bad days. When I stay out here too long, I start having headaches, mm. you know, and it just pull, pull my body down. It just drains me. All right. There's gonna be a lot of questions, I think, about how this came about and all of that. So we're gonna, I'm gonna hold, I'm gonna ask you to think about those questions, put them in the Q&A. What we're gonna to try to do is we're gonna look at all three cl the clips that we have, that's the first one. Um, in relation to this next clip that I'm gonna do a quick introduction is about a neighborhood in Norfolk, Virginia. And this clip, is really asked a simple question about the focus of whose community gets priority and gets a say. Is it the business growth community or a black working class public housing community in planning the future? And this is about um, um, basically gentrification in Norfolk, West Virginia. The Norfolk Redevelopment Housing Authority, or NRHA, owns this housing development. That means the city is Karina's landlord. The landlord would be responsible for the upkeep of the neighborhood, of the home, and NRHA has definitely failed to do so. In fact, Tidewater Gardens didn't pass its recent HUD inspection. Deep down inside, you want to move, but this is what I have right now. 
We're not even gonna talk about the fire alarm. That's just a battery. <laughs> I can't even get a battery switched out. Are you mad? I'm furious because they're demolishing my home. And I, I'm basically about to be out back without a home. So why is the city removing Karina and her neighbors? A quick walk through the neighborhood, and it's obvious to me. When you walk through this field, you can see why Tidewater Gardens is so valuable, right? Like, the projects are here, but that's yes. downtown. Yes. I mean, yes. it's right there. Yes. That's, that's the sole purpose of why they're trying to demolish and rebuild. Your proximity to downtown. Yes. And the value of what this could be yes. if it was developed. Yes. Tidewater Gardens is a couple of miles from trendy downtown with posh restaurants and a mall. It also borders on other neighborhoods with median incomes upward of $70,000. Here, in Karina's community, the median income is just $13,000. And there's been disinvestment over the past few years. The message is loud and clear. I'm frustrated because I feel like there's a lot of lies floating around and a lot of underlying causes of this redevelopment. So do you feel like when you disinvest in the people who are living here, you open the door for gentrification, right? Yes, you, the, the door for gentrification is open. Do you feel like the McDonald's is gone, the Shell Station is gone, the Save-A-Lot is gone, the Popeyes looks like it's going, all of this is in an effort to... Take our resources. It's sort of like, I'm not forcing you, but I'm forcing, forcing you. you. Yes. I looked at it this way. Even with an animal, when you take its resources, they switch and they have to leave where they're from to find food and shelter elsewhere. I feel like they're trying to clean up the city to make it something, and we just don't fit the picture. They don't care. They don't care, and it's because of the color of our skin. Um. There's also a wonderful um, pattern here in terms of, again, these are people that are involved in wanting to do something good and positive in terms of change, all right? And one of the things that, that journalism has always been about is making sure that, that there are ways that people who want to do that can be heard. And so that's a, another part of, that's nothing new, but how we do that is, is and how we go about doing that, I think is, is going to be part of our discussion. This last clip I'm going to show you is something that really hits home for any one of us that actually is aware in terms of the disparity on, on college campuses in relationship to um, food and housing. Um, while this clip is a few years old, um, boy, you know, I think all of us know, know about this. So um, this last one is called Hungry to Learn. Some people are coming here and they're not even making ends meet. They can barely afford the tuition. I don't have a uh, meal plan, so can't eat on campus unless I'm going out of pocket. They started making fun of the fact that I was homeless. From then, I didn't want to tell anyone. I'm not just the only one that has to use the resource that we have on campus because it's hard. It definitely is hard. I got an email the other day, basically, this is how much money you owe now. Is it worth it? This is a systemic problem, and it's bigger than any one of us. Every time I give a public lecture, a student comes up to me afterwards and says, I didn't know you knew. I'm gonna be paying back loans for the rest of my life. You gotta spend this much money to eat. There are definitely moments of panic when it's about four o'clock and you realize I haven't eaten anything all day. The federal government and the folks all the way at the tippy top might be trying to ignore it. The rest of us aren't. Please rise if you currently serve students experiencing food insecurity. Being class president, I feel like, is what kind of pushed me to stand out in a positive way. 
be like a positive representative. Saving was always difficult, so it's not like we had a pot for them for college. Now that I'm educating myself and I'm learning about food insecurity, I'm learning that this isn't right. We have to do better than this because it is our moral obligation to do better than this for all these young people who simply want an education, something that this country has always held dear. The thought of giving up always crossed my mind. I don't know if I can make this work anymore. Some days where I'm just like, is college for me? It would be easier to drop out of college than to be hungry in college. So because people can't fully pay the price of college, they have a very strong likelihood of ending up with nothing except debt. It's going to hurt us for generations. Okay, we have got three incredible um, stories that we're going to have a lot of questions um, to ask. I first though want to talk a little bit, and it's always, and I think also, and then we're going to move into the discussion uh, Q and A's. Um, one of the questions in part of our conversation to get started is, and again, we got a lot of experience. How are you doing your journalism today, especially demonstrated in these kinds of clips that is perhaps different or has changed because of the times and or because of the audience? And or because of uh, COVID-19. Um, so uh, in a lot of what you saw, not our hunger doc, um, which uh, Rose produced, by the way. Uh, but um, uh, for, for the other things that you saw, the projects for BET were all around uh, COVID-19, which made hopping on a plane for me personally, very, uh, I, I felt like I was playing Russian roulette. It was kind of early on in the crisis and I, I just wasn't sure, I didn't know. And was I bringing home something to my family? Uh, so very, very stressful. I think, and Rose can jump in and completely contradict me if she wants to, I think we, this is the kind of journalism we've been doing for a long time and in different places, uh, it was embraced in other places, it was less embraced um, because I think we've always tried to center our characters and not have uh, it be about the bigger process and the characters kind of just get shoved into the story, but it's actually about their lives and who they are and they're the narrators of their own stories. And I think over time, and I will give full credit to Rose who really We've, we've, I can't even tell you how many years we've worked together, <laughs> but, but she's just been so, um, because she's not, she's very willing to challenge you as a producer, we would go on stories and she would sort of push back and say, well, what about this? And think about this and think about that. And it, that's an amazing thing in a producer, because I think those are opportunities to grow. So uh, I think we've always been very good about saying, we're centering this character, we're giving, um, voice to this person. Now, what is their story? Are they lying to us? Are they BSing us? Are they spinning us? Um, what is the story and what are the questions that we have to ask to get to the heart of what this is about? And whether we're doing it in a doc or doing it in any of the content we create or the show that I anchor, matter of fact, um, I think we've done a pretty good job of really centering those characters. And when we fail to sit around and say, gosh, we really blew that one. Wow, that was, you know, we, we, we missed the boat. We forgot to center the people. And I, I truly believe when it comes to journalism for communities, as you mentioned, Janet, you talked about how little trust there is. Well, you know, often people will say, you know, how do we get the trust back? And I always think Rose will tell you that I always relate everything back to like, uh, I don't know why, dating. <laughs> and, and like the only way to get the trust back, right, is to, to be a trustworthy person. There's no spinning, there's no big speech, there's no thing you can do outside of saying, we believe in the community. And so what we did was to talk to people in the community and center their stories. And I, I think that that is the way to get the trust back, but also to remember that they're the people telling the story. Yeah, and be there. I mean, I think that's the, you know, that's, it, it, it's amazing how just being there makes a difference in my mind. But Rose. Yeah, absolutely. And I think another thing to add to that is that, you know, journalism, one of the main things of journalism is that it's a focus on figuring out what the truth is, right? You're in search of the truth, they used to say. It's harder to find out what the truth is now in some ways than ever before. 
because people take the truth and twist it. And even very legitimate or, you know, the people who've traditionally been your legitimate sources have found ways to take the truth and twist it and change it and make what's not true sound true and put out a lot of untruths. Um, and you have to work harder than you've ever had to before to get to the origins of things. That's why when you say you have to go out and sort of work a story and get out of your, you know, get off your Zoom call and off your telephone and off your smartphone and off your text and just go meet somebody and look them in the eye. Um, this is the time to do it. Yet, ironically, it's the time that we least do it. Yeah. So and so obviously, you know, so how did you how did you try to overcome that? Right. You know, this is a time that you've that you, you that's your that's your M.O. But yet in, in a lot of ways for journalists, it's, it's, it's incredibly hard to do that because the pandemic is just keeping that. So how did you sort of work through that? I think for us, and Rose, you can jump in as well. I, I think one, we've always been willing to go, I mean, Rose more than anybody, and I sometimes have been dragged along <laughs> um, because she's my producer. Um, I think we've always been willing to go to places, uh, the Chilean earthquake mm -hmm. where Rose is fluent in Spanish and I'm fluent in Spanglish. And I remember people going by talking to, I would try to interview them about why they were looting buildings and I, they would say something in Spanish. And I'd say to Rose, I, I couldn't catch it. What did they say? And she said, they say they're going to kill you if you ask them another <laughs> question. You know, I, I think it's about, you know, as you say, like you don't, you don't get anywhere if you don't show up, right? You have to be there and be in the story. And then only then will people talk to you. That was a lesson for me, Rose. I learned really at CNN. It was so funny because CNN would beat everybody on stories all the time. And, and the only reason why was because we would just get there in the middle of the night and we'd say, mm -hmm. hey, we're here. Can we set up our mast for our satellite truck in the in the in the middle of your you know, your, your driveway? You know, remember, so uh, Rose, when there was um, what story were we? Covering? I think it was a Newtown school shooting. That was all Rose amazingly being able to say, you know, this is where we need to be location wise. And again, it's showing up as 85% of mm -hmm. having people feel like they may love you, they may hate you, but showing up and saying, we're here to tell this story. We'd love to hear from you. Um, I think that makes a big difference. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, you know, journalism is not a game of telephone. It's not like one person told some person, told some person, told some person, but it, it's increasingly become that with the proliferation of media outlets. You, if you honestly do a little bit of research on any one topic, you can dig back to find the origin because you'll see a story in Vox and it's like very interesting. And then you'll see some fact in media. I mean, you'll say, oh, that was in the Vox story. And then you'll see it in some other place. You'll say, well, that was in the, the Medium story. And then you'll see it in the New York Times, usually weeks later. And for some people, that's the first time they've seen it. So that's the definitive story. And you ask yourself, well, who actually went out and reported this? Who actually was the primary source for this? You know, the other area in which it hurts a lot is in the generation of ideas, because, you know, before a story is a story, it's an idea or a pitch to an editor, right? And so if you don't go out and find out what's really happening in communities and you just get your stories from reading other people's work, then you're just duplicating. You're not really reporting. Oh, my gosh. Can I share the story, Rose, of when we, reco we covered uh, Latino in America for CNN? So Rose and I... We're there to do a, a groundbreaking uh, documentary uh, called Latino in America for CNN. There are probably what, 15 people in the room, maybe mm -hmm. 20, all around these one of those big giant conference room tables. And Rose and I were the only Latinas in the room, if I remember correctly. And the conversation starts out with the producer telling us, the executive producer, that he knows what he's gonna do, right? So we're all in this meeting, I'm the talent, and we're being told like there's no discussion, this is what it's gonna be. And then the question becomes, is it 51 million Latinos or in the US or is it, is it 48? Because are Puerto Ricans considered Americans? And I remember Rose and I look across each other. We're not sitting near each other. Mm -hmm. We kind of look over at each other like, <laughs> this is Googleable. And it went on for probably 10 minutes, like a real conversation. And I think that those are the moments where you begin to get very worried, right? We're doing something that's amazing. We've been given a massive budget to do it. And yet, like all the questions and, and all the debate and all the discussion has sort of been, 
pushed aside because there was a very clear idea like, well, this is what we're doing. We're doing this. In fact, one of the stories I remember was about, uh, I think me actually, right? It was about Soledad. And I remember thinking like, this is an opportunity to tell the story of, of a Latino community. Like, why would I, I mean, listen, nobody loves me more than me and more me is always better, <laughs> but still, you know, no, it, this is important and this is groundbreaking and it should be an amazing story that people are pitching and fighting to get on. And I remember just being very afraid of that team because um, they just didn't know what they were doing, honestly. And so I think it's one of those things where you really do have to sort of start with this idea of, you know, pitching and coming up with the idea of the story that's rooted in what's actually happening in a community, which often the people who live there or are adjacent to that community in some capacity have insight into. And so I, I think I left that meeting and walked upstairs to the, the president of CNN's office. And I was like, yeah, this is not going to work. Like we need to, we need to start all over again. And we did, we, we started again and came up with a really good concept of, uh, at that time, the concept, which I thought was genius was um, Garcia was the eighth most popular American name. And how do you, through that lens, tell the story of the Garcias in America? So it was a, a genius idea that one of our, uh, Emily, I think was the one who came up with that, if I'm not mistaken, Rose, a, a great producer uh, came up with that idea. And so there was just so much opportunity to, to have an interesting lens on something. And I think you sometimes have to push back on people who are willing to do the same old, same old, same old, and not reach out, especially to young people and say, you know, here's how we think about this story. That kind of hits me a little bit is, is um, a, a, of a question. We do have two questions already lining up in our Q&A. So I'm going to, it kind of has hit me that um, one of the things that I, it, it's not like this is a new concept, but it seems to be a concept that is harder to see in what, in what and it seems to be missing more. In, in, in journalism today, which is trying to figure out ways to not just merely regurgitate, but really to find a different angle, but also to hear a different thing. And quite honestly, um, that's another aspect of why. So I wanna think of what is missing and how might we as journalists and really sort of figure out how to zone in better than in, in, the, in this time of it, because I think that seems to be some of the things that may be missing and maybe how we need to re, recalibrate, I think somehow how we go about of what is really, what is really important in terms of news that people want. Well, Rose, I think you should talk about this because I, I honestly, I think the answer is in your students. It's in young people. They have a much, I mean, truly, I wish it were in old people. I wish it were in 55 year old ladies because then I would be right there. But, but the answer actually are in younger people who can see around the corners of what's happening in the conversation in the community. Rose? Yeah, also I think, you know, readers and viewers out there have to demand better. I know that there's a lot of sort of, you know, questioning out there of like, you know, the media and the media lead and is the media out of touch and is the media this and is the media that. And I think, you know, I think that, you know, what really people should be demanding is authenticity. That, you know, publications and TV stations represent the public and try to represent what's really going on in the public. For, you know, for all the people that were surprised, say, by the election results in 2016, or were surprised by the election results in 2020, you, know, you need to look no further than the publications that actually did go to communities, the people that told the story of change that was happening in Georgia, the people that went out into America and looked at racial tensions and racial divides uh, during the 2016 election. You know, the stories are there, um, but you have to demand authentic reporting. I'm going to bring in a couple of the questions and the questioners here. I mean, I could ask some more, but I also think we've got some really good questions coming up. So I want to introduce uh, Kathy Weiss. And I hope I'm saying that because she had um, a, a, a she's had a question, particularly about the first story of Shingle Mountain and about sort of how do how do environmental issues somehow somehow have a hard time getting out there, right? And get, and, 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 and really get getting told. So Kathy, um, I hope I didn't give away your question. So I want to know if it's okay for um, you to ask that question more directly to both Soledad and Rose. 
Thank you. <laughs> um, and, and thank you, Soledad. I actually am an Emerson board member um, with no background at the school, but uh, compelled by what it does. So my question is really how this came on your radar screen. And I give a, a one sentence. Um, many years ago, I was involved with a zoning issue in a um, community that uh, in a county that actually cited all of its toxic facilities in the one neighborhood that was black and brown in an otherwise very wealthy county. And, and I don't think there's ever been a local story about this place that it's, it had 12 toxic facilities. It was the waste facility. It was the garbage facility. It was the power plant, on and on. So how did this get to your radar screen? Yeah, I think um, the first answer and the short answer is always that I have amazing producers like Rose who are just brilliant. And, um, and so a lot of it is just research. But what you're pointing out is not unusual, right? Like these are all public documents. They're public records. This is... <laughs> Hi. Uh, this is uh, folks who uh, keep, you know, these these are are. Um, it's it's the way reporters look into stories in that they can see that there's a list of well, where are all the public sites? Where are all the the waste sites? Uh, the guy who was running that waste site, by the way, when I got him on the phone, I just called him up, um, and he he used to be on a reality TV show, uh, and when I got him on the phone, he said, yeah, ugh, who'd want to live there? I wouldn't want to live there. And you're like, you're the guy dumping the stuff in people's backyard. And so, you know, clearly he was just taking advantage of what he knew he could take advantage of and he was dumping illegally. But it's a lot of public record. When Rose and I were working on a, a, a memoir that I wrote, um, probably what now, Rose, 2010 to 11 years ago. So quite a while ago, you know, to look at the public record and see the housing crisis that was unfolding in my neighborhood in Long Island, where I grew up, which I knew nothing about, but it was because there had been lawsuits and you could actually find them quite easily by kind of Googling like race lawsuits, mm -hmm. <laughs> the, the Suffolk County and, and Long Island, and you could figure it out pretty easily. And I think that's really what our researchers do. They dive into you know, where are the stories that are most active, where something is happening, where it would be very visual, where we can see um, just a really good story unfolding in terms of the, the drama, frankly, and then is it a good example of environmental racism? But what you're pointing out, Kathy, is, is so typical. It's not like, oh my gosh, mm -hmm. your place and my place are the only two places <laughs> in America. I, it, no, not at all. It's very, very, consistent and very, very typical. And because of that, it's actually quite easy to find. If you lay over redlining maps, the, the maps where black and brown people were forced to live from the forties and every community has them, you know, these redlining maps, you'll actually see they very closely match up to the areas where toxic dumping happens. Is that an accident? I do not think so. I think it's very intentional. Thank you. I think the message to the students is dig and yeah. search. And, and Rose, is, uh, honestly, yeah. Rose, is a, Rose is a genius at this. I mean, she will not brag about herself, so I'll take a moment to brag about her. <laughs> she, she really is. She is, and I think this is where that kind of journalism that teaches you about digging and reading documents and understanding lawsuits, et cetera, et cetera, is very, very helpful. Look, and I'd say <laughs> luck plays into it. You know, picking up the phone plays into it, leaving your house and going to social events and, you know, going to activities that organizations have just to hang out and talk to people plays into it. You know, I mean, that's, that's really how you get most of your best stories. And I, I have to tell you, the best stories I've done in my career came from people who called me, from friends, some of them, people like you who said, did you know that in my community X is happening? I mean, cold call a reporter because, you know, story ideas are like manna from heaven. You can just, you know, I, I had a guy call me once when I was a very young reporter to tell me that his dad had gone missing and he had Alzheimer's, right? You, you got, I was at the New York Daily News and you got calls like these by the dozens every week from people who wanted attention, 
from that family member. I didn't really know what to do with it. And I went up to an editor because I was, I was young, I was really new. And so what do I say to this guy? And he said, what do you mean, what do you say to this guy? You just told me that you get lots of calls from people who have their parents, you know, just wander off. That's an amazing story. That is a, an incredible human drama. Let's do a whole big long piece on Alzheimer's and, and what happens to people who wander off and that kind of thing. Turned out to be a great story. It's just totally random phone call from a guy. Let me ask a little bit is that one of the things we've been talking about at, at Emerson is again, trying to sort of put work with our students in communities and working with community groups. Cause sometimes the issue is there's, there's not enough, there aren't enough journalists sometimes to really spend, have the time and, and spend the effort on this. So one of, one of the, the discussions has been, maybe we recruit and work with community folks in showing them some of this, how do you read documents? How can you find that? Yeah. So that there is this sort of collaborative, um, in addition to just not, not only just sourcing, they, they also do some of the legwork um, that really digs into some of this stuff. And then that there becomes by, by this collaboration, you might be able to, with their information, they might be able to collect data that could do, that could create some, some, some data journalism. So there's, so part of the idea is too, is that um, with news numbers shrinking, how might we still have those great stories in ways that we can, we can utilize different things. And I think that's such a good point. Um, we often, uh, Rose and I often get uh, proposals and pitches from people who say, so last month, my cousin, so-and-so did such and such. You're like, yeah, that's gonna be a tough one for a documentary. And sometimes it's just explaining to people like, wow, that is a really amazing story. Boy, we wish we had been there. I wish you'd called me eight weeks ago. I wish you had shot it. I wish you had... It's interesting today with, with TikTok and because people are so comfortable uh, shooting themselves, it's actually a little bit easier where you can tell people we need to capture this event and they understand what that means. I think, what do you think Rose, 10, 15 years ago, people would yeah. not have necessarily done a, a good job. We worked on a doc where we handed out cameras to people and it was hard. You literally had to manage them getting the content back to you. And I think that's changed very dramatically. Um, it's just much easier nowadays. So, so yeah, I, I think it's exactly that because you do need people who can say, I'll do the first chunk of the legwork and kind of pull the pieces together and just gather some of this data so you can see that there's a story here. And then you bring it to someone who has an expertise in ferreting out stories and then you're in pretty good shape. Yeah, let me tell you, I'll be the first to admit that whole document digging, data crunching, you know, get a software, put it on an Excel sheet and figure, that is not my strength at all. I am not good at it. And what I do, which is what most journalists do, is if somebody has a case in court or someone thinks that there's been a lawsuit or there's some legal document that I think might tell me something, I call up a lawyer, I call up a friend. I call up, you know, the lawyer for the town that I'm investigating even and ask him, you know, just straight out, have you ever been sued for X? You know, where would I find the lawsuit? You know, just, most people will help you. Lawyers love to help you. Doctors really love to help you. You know, professional people, like all of us have big egos. They love to take a reporter under their wing and say, oh, this is how you do it. And as for collaboration, there are a lot of organizations out there, foundations in particular, like the fund, places that gather data. And you can go to these places and you can say, hey, I'm curious, what are, for instance, the most, the towns in America that have the biggest hunger problem? And they'll crunch the data for you and they'll tell you. Um, and you know, that's a very legitimate way to do things. Um, it's organizations have more resources than sometimes you have as a journalist. They know a lot more about the topic. I mean, we're not experts in everything. You know, and sometimes it helps just to have somebody explain something to you so that when you're reporting on it, you know you're not turning into an idiot. I mean, I used to go to town planning meetings when I was a young reporter and they would talk about assessed valuation. And I was like, oh my God, what is that? And a whole two hour meeting on assessed valuation and how are you gonna tax the community? So I'd go up to a legislator and say, would you please explain this to me? And they'd explain it to you. And then suddenly you know something and you understand the conversation. But I think, Rose, you make a great point, which is you, it goes back to what you originally said, which is 
you have to spend time in the community, right? You have to actually go to the meetings. You have to sit down. You have to know who's the legislature. Um, you have to be able to know who can answer your, <coughs> me, answer your questions. And you have to know who the players are. And all that takes time, right? There's no dropping in, you know, kind of hitting the ground, interviewing people for 10 minutes and running out, <coughs> excuse me. <clears throat> and, and then feeling like I spent some time in this community, really spending the time and getting to know a community, I think, and I'm sure Rose would agree, will absolutely pay off uh, over and over and over again for you if you do it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, when they, especially when you do longer form work. I mean, these documentaries, you spend a lot of time with people. I was on a call today with a group that we're trying to convince to help us uh, find characters for a documentary we're doing. And one of the people asked me very legitimate is like, how do you think you're going to get people to talk to you? Because we've tried to get them to talk to media before and they don't want to talk uh, to, to the media. They're ashamed, they're shy, they're poor, they're worried about being taken advantage of. And, and I said, I'm going to go and I'm going to meet them one time and I'm going to meet them a second time and I'm going to call them in between the meetings and I'm going to let them get to know me a little bit. And they have to be able to look me in the eye and say, I trust that woman. She's going to tell my story. She's not going to take advantage of me. Um, and, and that's kind of what it is. These are about human interactions. Yeah. You can't just pop in and say, Hey, listen, can I ask you five questions about what it's like to be homeless? I mean, it just doesn't work like that. What's it like to be hungry? It doesn't work like that. Anybody who has a good story to tell will probably run from that frankly, and you, you have to have them see what is the value of talking to you. Mm -hmm. um, Shannon Spence, I think you also sort of that a little bit as how do you get to the to ethical storytelling? So, uh, uh, and I think we've been talking a little bit about it. So maybe you might want to ask a little, you may have something else you'd like to, or go dig a little deeper into that topic. So fire away, Shannon, Shannon Spence. I Hi, Soledad and Rose, uh, Shannon Spence, class of 2010. Um, I, you know, thanks so much for joining Emerson Week. This is so exciting. Um, I work at what I'm the, the director of communications at one of those expert data crunchy shops. And in fact, Rose, we've worked with you and Soledad. We worked with Joe and Joey on the listening tour. Um, so we have been in each other's network before, but I wanted to come at this from a different angle maybe than um, as a journalist, because I'm obviously not a journalist, I'm a director of communication and I start from the data and would like to bring human-centered stories to them in our presentation more. And I, I went to Emerson, but I didn't train in the journalist department, sorry, Janet. Um, and I just, I struggle with understanding what the tenets of ethical journalism are and how you can authentically present someone's story, um, but also make sure you're sort of not taking advantage of those underserved communities and trying to put a square peg into a round hole or make the story fit the data that you have. And we have been talking quite a lot about that. I have a full page of notes, but I just didn't know if from my angle of the shop, you had any sort of advice on how to really think about how to present to present to the subjects and then also present their stories to an audience. In an I think that's such a great question. And I think um, Rose and I come at this often. Um, I think the best thing you can do is have a great Rolodex of, I have four people who are willing to talk to you, right? Mm -hmm. so, so in a way you become the conduit through which they feel comfortable talking to the media. Uh, and because I, I do think for me, when it's completely served up to me by the communications director, it's like, mm, do I want to do a story that's been sort of shaped and, and presented? I think most journalists are going to say no. But I have found it very helpful when someone says, listen, I got four people who are more than happy to talk to you, want me to connect you. And, and that's because you know them, they trust you, you do the texting introduction, and suddenly I'm now talking to someone and I can say, oh, this person's great, they're really good. You can say, this person's great, here's their backstory, this person, pretty good, you know, blah, blah, blah. And by the way, you kind of help someone navigate pulling their story together. I find that incredibly helpful. Sometimes I do get an entirely like prepared pitch with the bow done for me. And I think, mm -hmm. oh, that probably is something that I don't want to go anywhere near. Uh, so I, I think just giving people access. Listen, I got four people, great talkers, 
you know, they've done a lot of stuff. They, but if you want, if you want them, let me know. Mm-hmm. And I think Rose, we've had a really, um, a lot of good luck with that. Yeah. Uh, certainly oh, in starting her, starting her search. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I'm giving access to your people. I mean, if you trust the journalist and they have a good reputation, come to them with something and, you know, they're going to go for it. A good story is a good story. I mean, I, one thing that I would say on both sides of that equation is that as a journalist, you should always be honest about the story that you're doing. Even when you're investigating somebody and trying to, you know, do a gotcha kind of journalism sort of thing, be honest about what you're doing. I mean, you don't have to sell, come up to somebody and say, you know, hello, Mr. Legislator, I think you're corrupt and you're taking bribes and I'm going to catch you. You don't have to do that, but you can tell them that you're doing a story about their finances, that you're scrutinizing what they're doing. And, you know, then you're not doing a disservice to anybody in the piece. And it's certainly the same thing when you deal with vulnerable communities. You know, be honest about what you're doing. Let people make a decision for themselves that's informed and explain it to them in a way that is um, understandable to them. Because, you know, one thing that I think happens too much in journalism is you come to people who are, you know, are simple people or people that don't have a whole lot of education or wherewithal at dealing with the media, et cetera. And you give them kind of like a song and dance and then you go and do the story and they don't know the impact of it. Um, You know, people, especially if it's about a very emotional issue, you have to tread extremely lightly. Um, And I think PR people have to be very careful when they're trying to sell a story that they don't hand somebody over, you know. A lawyer uh, the other day uh, sued a school district because they haven't reopened yet. And he talked to all these people into joining his lawsuit and then put out media and told their stories in a lawsuit. So a woman who was one of the plaintiffs called me in tears because she knew me a little bit. She said, I don't know what to do. My kid's story is out there and my kid never told me I could tell their story. They're really upset and they're having mental health issues. And I said, you know, look, unfortunately you can't really unring that bell. You're part of the suit and the media are going to write about it. And, you know, she's a very well-educated woman. You would have thought she could have predicted this, but people can't always predict that stuff because they're not that media savvy. So you have to tell them, if you're involved in this, this and this and this may happen. I also think you can never go wrong with that. I, I really, I mean, I've now done this for just under 299 years. And I really feel like Rose and I are so straightforward because I'd rather have someone say no, a very clear, I'm not interested, than someone say yes, and then it becomes a mess because they don't know what they're getting into. I have no problem saying. So we are gonna walk through the finances. So a couple of things you're gonna wanna prepare for is this, this, and this, or I need you to explain to people to understand how are you sleeping in your car? I'm sure for you, it's stressful and terrible and really difficult, but for a lot of people, they just don't even understand the logistics. So I'd like you to slow down and walk us through how that works. Where do you park? What is safe? What are you worried about? How do you sleep in your car? I mean, literally walk me through. And I think once you prep people with, here's what I really need to understand and you lay it out, I I find it, I I think they're actually very grateful for clarity. And those who don't want to do it say, oh my gosh, no, I would never want to do that. And then you can let them go and, and focus on the people who are interested in being part of the story. That's really helpful. Thank you so much. Great. Um, Carly is uh, asked a question that I, I had on my list, which is the advocacy question and, and, and an advocating idea. So Carly, I'm going to let you uh, go forth and I hope I didn't steal your thunder there. I keep on, I love these questions. So go forth. <laughs> Hi. Um, thank you so much both for, for, uh, being part of this event. I am. No one a- turns their cameras on. Carly, put your camera on so I can see you. I don't think I have permission to do that. Oh, is that what's going on? Yeah, right. I think that's what it is. Otherwise, I imagine. I- Hi, Carly. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I'm a current junior and I'm kind of trying to figure out, you know, there's kind of this line. I feel like you always walk with stories where you, you, you find, you find an angle, you find this idea that you can be passionate about and, and how do you go about advocating for that. So when you talked about this Latino in America story, knowing that there was kind of a, a better path to be taken in the story, how do you go about advocating for your ideas without seeming like, I don't know, advocating for your ideas without being too harsh or, you know, like making enemies in the meantime, you know, you don't want to end those pr- professional contacts, you know? Yeah, it's a great question. And I think for me, 
I don't love the word advocating um, because I think often people sort of look down at, you know, someone who's advocating for someone, right? It feels like, well, you're doing that for someone. I mean, I, I feel like we should advocate for the truth. We should advocate for accuracy. We should advocate for, and so maybe, I don't know, Rose could probably tell you better than I could if I've made some enemies because I, I don't have a problem, literally. I, I left that Latino in America doc and I walked right to the president's office because I knew I had the leverage and the power to do that as the anchor. And I was very worried and I was embarrassed. I thought if this thing airs, it's gonna be on me and I will not have stopped something that's gonna be bad. We had talked about all the stories and they were not interesting, right? An entire six minutes was based on me, which again, I love me. We should not be doing me for Latino in America. And so sometimes I think you have to, in a very pleasant way, kind of go in and say, hey, I think there's a better way. I think one answer is to never, ever, ever criticize something without a better solution that you mm -hmm. can offer. When people just criticize, it drives me crazy. You know, that's just whining. You need someone to say, I didn't love this. What I was thinking was maybe we could do more of this. And usually what happens in a newsroom is you find some happy medium that you kind of both move to. Um, and again, I, I don't know that it's advocating uh, as much as saying, I think a more accurate story is and saying, so I brought in some data. And what you'll actually see is that 96% of the time X, Y, Z. So, you know, I know we're doing this over here. A good, good example would be Rose. When we went to cover the Haiti earthquake, everybody at CNN was doing stories on taking orphans out of Haiti. Oh my God, the rescue of orphans, the babies need to be rescued. And Rose is like, if you look at the data, 1,200 children come out of Haiti every year, every year. I mean, shouldn't we be looking at what happens to the parents? Like the actual story of the half a million orphans in Haiti is that their parents who in, in Haiti, the orphans actually have living parents. Why can't their parents take care of them? Like, isn't that the overwhelming story that this 1,200, very dramatic, very emotional drop in the bucket it's not really real for the amount of effort we're putting into the story. It doesn't exist in this way. And I, again, I, I really credit Rose and we've been working together for a long time and always being willing to say, I just really wanna throw this out here because I don't feel cool about talking about taking children out of a country. Like we should have a conversation about this. Can you save a country by removing all its children? No. Can you, are, are they gonna remove all the children from Haiti? 1,200 per year, go. That's what went. And so, you know, are we doing a disservice by acting as if that's the, the primary narrative when it was not clearly? So who's offering alternatives? Maybe that should be our focus. And I think Rose and I have been very good at doing that, taking the data and saying, well, the data is really telling us something else. So we're gonna do this something else. And we're not gonna worry about those people over there. We just sell them, you know, the data doesn't support what you're doing. It's very interesting you use the word advocating because I think it's really interesting what happens in a newsroom. The same two people could come to you and pitch the same story. And if one of them is a person of color, they're advocating for a community. And if the other person is white, they're pitching a story. It's, it's really interesting and you learn it very, very early in your career. And I think that's why what Soledad is saying about data um, is so important because you have to come up and like know that this is the world and people come to it from different frames and with different prejudices. And depending on who you're pitching to, you need to present things in different ways. So I find that the best approach is to just come at it with facts. You know, this is what's happening. Here's some facts, here's some data to back it up. This is a really good story. And then wait to see what kind of pushback you get. Um, you know, is the, is the pushback that, oh, you know, that's really interesting story about homeowners, but everybody in this story is black. So isn't it an urban story? And then you can come back and say, well, but the people happen to live in the suburbs. So I don't understand how it's an urban story. You know, you, you really have to be armed with a lot of information when you pitch a story because you're going into this, you know, maelstrom of, of ideas and, and opinions and differences and diversity and et cetera. Yeah, the data tells me is a really great line. Mm -hmm. I don't know, but the data tells me that actually, you know, 65% of the people in this class are gonna be women. So maybe the focus should be women or, you know, more than half of these people are people of color. So I think we need to have this kind of representation in the story. 
you know, are you advocating for people? Come? No, you're just actually accurately reflecting what the data tells you. Mm -hmm. I'm going to, I'm going to add on to that because one of my questions, so I'm going to jump in here a little bit is so that you have not, you have not been a shrinking violet when it comes to, um, putting out that journalism needs to clean its own house when it comes to diversity, equity, and inclusion, oh. <laughs> right? Let me take uh. a moment while I slam my head into the wall. Yes. <laughs> and, and even, you know, and I, and, and, and I also think um, sort of, it's not quite the same thing, but your house testimony about disinformation is kind of also in this line of w journalism sometimes Yes, got, it's got some got some work to do. We we platform people who should not be platformed, and especially today, you know, I think often we don't think about: Are you giving? I mean, Rose and I discuss this a lot. Are you using your platform and giving people credibility? Right, even if you're trying to knock them down, which often I don't even think people are trying to do. So, yeah, it's been very very problematic. And so, I literally, I'm not even joking. I sometimes want to just slam my head into a wall because you think this is just so poorly done and we should do a better job of how we think about storytelling and how we think about journalism and how we think about you know elevating shouldn't we only be talking about things that are true should we elevate somebody who we know is lying my my argument would be no not at all yeah we shouldn't be elevating reporters who are lying either i mean you have you know one of the things that's been most troubling about the last several years is that you have reporters that disseminate utter fiction you know, and, and big ones, not just, you know, the obscure guy with the agenda, um, et cetera. I mean, big name reporters go out there and say things that are just patently untrue. And, and also the use of them. sources. I mean, Rose, you're a print reporter, certainly more than me. So uh, I know that we, we just very rarely use anonymous sources. I mean, it would, mm -hmm. at CNN, you needed a lot of clearance to have a story rely on anonymous sources. And I was reading something the other day I think it was Politico, mostly because I really dislike Politico. So I think it was Politico. And I, I think they had literally a description that there was nobody named in the story at all. It was all anonymous sources, sources close to this person, sources close to that person. And you think, how do you get away with writing an entire article where there's no name person to hang your story on? I, I think that is, I think that's really become a big problem nowadays. Mm -hmm. And I would say that's kind of also, and I'm going to get into to Megan Mitchell's question, that's kind of also sort of, um, again, why there is this such distrust? Well, because, well, I don't know where, you know, you know, how, 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 how it goes back to where do you find the trust? Well, one, you put the, you, know, you put faces to people and things like that. So I definitely think that's um, a part of it. And I know Megan Mitchell, um, Megan, Long time no see. Good to hear from you. Um, uh, is a has a has a couple of questions. So, but I but I think this also ties in with that. So go ahead, um, uh, Megan, in with some of this stuff. Yeah, I mean, actually, a lot of the questions that I've been kind of putting forth, you guys have been answering subsequently, and a lot of your answers. So thank you for that. Um, also, you know, I I'm actually a, an anchor and reporter at the Hearst affiliate in Cincinnati. So. Um, so Ledet, I met you in our in our makeup room one time, and you were phenomenal. So thank you so much for that. And uh, graduated from Emerson in 2014. Um, you know, I did mention, and you guys brought this up a little bit, which is that the biggest thing I struggle with is is pitching stories, right? So a lot of the the contacts that I have in the community are not people who are overlooked, right? I mean, they're people in the community who who I see on bigger stories who. Um, you know, already have a platform, already have a significant voice in the community. And so, you know, you guys mentioned going out into the community. It's like, what exactly does that mean? You know, That's one of the things you guys said was community meetings. Uh, put that in my notes, going to start going to those community meetings. Um, but, but anything else, like, should I just walk into a barber shop and be like, what's up, guys? <laughs> Um, you know, a little bit, yes, barbershop might be weird because there's not that many people to barbershop, but true. kind of, you know, I, I literally think it's, if you're covering a community and it's not exactly where you live, go food shopping, right? And you talk to the people and you say, whoo, that long, hey, long day for you. And they're like, let me, I, I, every time I would go to a grocery store, someone would say, the number of people in the middle of coronavirus who are screaming at us, you're like, wow, 
Yeah, I mean, it was amazing. And, and, mm-hmm. and so, yeah, there is a little bit of you go and you do those regular things versus you show up with a camera. Some of it, I think, is, is, is going to have to be a little bit on your off time, right? So that means like lunch in a neighborhood that you might be covering, but you don't live there. Or, yeah. or asking people out to lunch and doing one of those, hey, I know you know a lot of interesting stories. Can we just talk for an hour? Just throw out some of the things that you're thinking about because you'll be surprised. They'll say, well, you know, everybody's fighting against this dump. And you're like, what dump? I had no idea. I didn't know there was a dump coming in or Mm. I didn't know there was this issue over here. So I think sometimes it literally is about taking people who are not the head person, but their assistants and say, I don't want to talk about your boss. No, no, I just want to get to know you and just tell me what's happening. Talk about your neighborhood. I mean, I, I really want to make sure that I'm elevating some of the interesting stories that are happening. I was doing an interview on my podcast the other day Uh, And this guy was talking about, I grew up in Long Island, and he was talking about Levittown. And he said, um, and Robert Moses, and Robert Moses was uh, just a a very uh, racist guy who built Robert Moses State Park. If you were from Long Island, you cut out of high school to go to Robert Moses State Park as a kid. But one of the things Robert Moses did was he would put really low bridges over the highways because he wanted to make sure buses couldn't go. So people from the city, he did not want anybody from the city coming out to Long Island. He was very overt about it. And this guy said to me, oh my gosh, I have so much data. I've been collecting so many documents about this, right? So in my head, I'm like, okay, (laughs) click. This is going to be a great documentary one day about Levittown and what happened in Long Island. I mean, Long Island apparently, which I did not know, was the, the big center of the Ku Klux Klan in the 1920s, um, who knew? But this guy's been cre- creating and collecting document documents on it. So to me, that just reminds me, oh, I need to go and have lunch with this guy, coffee with this guy one of these days, right? Yes. To see what he really has. And that will become a project, not next week, not next month, but a year from now, there's no question we will be working on this project in some capacity. So I think it's that it's very rarely their TV savvy bosses, you know, because they want to be on TV. They understand what they need to get from you. It's their underlings. It's the guy who runs the pizza shop. It's the people who are worried about, you know, their homes being torn down for the highway being, you know, uh, widened, things like that. And the only way to really get those folks is by just hitting them up. Yeah, Absolutely. I think another thing you can do is, you know, a lot of journalism organizations used to, and some still do assign people beat. So you had to be an Insta expert and super connected in say the schools or the police department or whatever. What you can do is like assign yourself sort of mini beat and just kind of explore a topic and reach out to people for off the record conversations about that topic until you get to know them enough that you can pick their brains for ideas and get guidance from them. Because you'll find out that a lot of what's reported out there misses context. I mean, completely misses the boat. And big newspapers, I mean, like the Washington Post and the New York Times and big TV, you know, CBS News and ABC News, they, they get things wrong because they're not in touch with the communities where these things are happening and they don't have people to mm. explain things to them. So they're just reporting what a lawsuit said, or they're just reporting something cool that somebody said at an event. I have a great example of this, which I'll try to make very, very short. The other day, somebody sent me a great article in Columbia Journalism Review um, that was written by a guy who was just so frustrated because there was a story that's been reported over and over and over again that is completely wrong. And it was about how it's harder to get into some New York City high schools than it is to get into Harvard. And it showed these statistics about how 5,000 people applied for 200 slots. But what nobody has ever told you is that 5,000 students listed this one school as one of 12 choices. So if you really just look at the people who made it their first choice, it was probably like a two to one ratio, not a you know 600 applicants per one seat mm-hmm. kind of ratio, right? But this has been wrong forever. And this is because these reporters don't have direct contact to communities where their stories live. Absolutely. And people have to be called on that, by the way. I mean, I think there is no problem at all calling up people and saying, that's wrong. You're wrong. Mm -hmm. You got to fix it. This is wrong. Yeah. If you wouldn't mind, I just have one more kind of question about the future of journalism. And it it related a little bit more to what we were talking about previous to this question. But um, I feel like as a journalist, we're told to say things like, so-and-so believes that systemic racism exists or like, 
Dr. Blank says that climate change is real. Do you think that there's ever going to be a point, especially in local journalism, where we're not, we aren't as progressive as a lot of the networks and cable stations, uh, where issues of oppression or scientific fact will be able to be less hypothetical in the way that we word it and more fact? Mm -hmm. and, and do you see that happening? That's a tough question because often that comes down from the leadership at your local station. And having worked in many local stations, there's often some very strict rules about that. Um, again, when I worked in local news, I was much more, you know, so-and-so says such and such. Also, they also say water is wet. So we're going to just go with that's a fact. And, you know, and, and you almost would highlight like, this is true. System systemic racism is a thing. And so we're moving forward as it's a thing. Um, because I don't think you really inform people if everything becomes, well, we're not 100% sure. We are sure on some things. Uh, data yeah. is sure. Science is sure. I mean, we could literally say, you know, the NASA says that, you know, the, there that's the moon, but who, who really <laughs> knows? I mean, I, I don't know. I'm not up there. How can I tell? Mm -hmm. And I, I just don't think it's a, a win to play that game. Sometimes I think that is going to be a realistically what is your tenure at the station? How much power do you have? How much, um, yeah. and, and, and listen, I remember during Hurricane Katrina, um, uh, what was his name? Aaron Brown had the show on the night before my show went on in the morning and he started calling everybody refugees. And the next morning we were all there with our dictionaries, literally arguing over should people be called refugees or evacuees. And the reason they were called evacuees is because of me, really because of my executive producer, because she's like, absolutely no way we're calling people refugees. They are not refugees. It just, it's not, a no, you are wrong. It is not a thing. This is not, they don't meet the definition of refugees. These are people who've been evacuated from their homes. They are evacuees. But otherwise, because at that point it was like 50, 50, some people are calling them refugees, some people are calling evacuees. And we're like, oh no, no, we're killing that. That's dead. No. Nope. Uh, and she was from New Orleans. So she felt very strongly that it really mattered the definition, probably more than everybody else who wasn't from there, right? Who thought like, I don't know, what are we calling them? We'll go with whatever. So sometimes you just have to stick up for the thing that you think is the right thing. And again, it's gonna depend on your relationship with the top executives and how they feel about it. Uh, and obviously there are some people who own stations who don't think climate change is a thing and you're really getting into a bigger conversation, but my argument has always been climate change is a thing. The earth is round. There is racism. That's why we're doing this story. We're moving forward. Yeah. And you know, yeah. Don't be afraid of the word says. A really good editor once gave me some advice and he said, don't be afraid of the word says. You don't need to say people believe they admit they, you know, they, the easy thing is just say they said it and say what they said and then describe who they are. You know, blah, blah, blah. Who's been studying climate change for 55 years at Harvard and has, you know, whatever, says blah, blah, blah. You know, and, and you don't have to say he believes it or he advocates for it or he pushes the idea or, or whatever. You know, let people speak for themselves. And oftentimes that's the better, you know, way to go. The other thing you can you have to uh, worry about though is being forced into having this false balance thing. This, you know, on the one side, this on the one side, that. That's where the really tough arguments are being had uh, with editors at news organizations, because there's a sense that for every climate change person, there has to be a climate change denier, you know, and you can see how topics age out of that. Um, just to give you an example of the Holocaust, you no longer have to have a Holocaust denier in every story. It seems ridiculous to do something like that. Racism on the other hand, police brutality, you have to have a this and a that. For a long time, Soledad and I both, you know, saw this happen throughout many years in, in our career. Gay marriage. Here's the Christian the coalition guy or the you know family research council guy telling you how all people who are gay are pedophiles and this is the end of society and marriage is between two people of, of uh, different uh, genders. And here's the other guy. And it took a long time and you saw the evolution of this before it was accepted as an actual thing. It took you know the public moving. And so you have to have these difficult and complicated conversations with your editors all the time and the best friend that you have are the facts and the data absolutely the earth is not flat 
<laughs> and they do not, we do not get, that's honestly, I go back to that all the time when people want to add like, but what about the voice pushing back? I'm like, no, 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 no. The flat earthers don't get to come. Every time I do a story on NASA and, and you know, there's going to be a meteor shower or something, we don't say, but we thought we'd check in with Steve who lives in his mom's basement and thinks the earth is flat. Steve, NASA is telling us about a meteor shower. You know, I mean, it's, it, it's so overtly ridiculous that I think people understand this idea of we need that other voice in that case becomes almost farcical. Thank you guys so much. Thank you. I'm I'm going to call on my colleague, uh, Gina Gale, who's, who also is kind of like, how do, how do I work with young people in, in, and communities and things? So go ahead, Gina. Hi, Janet. Thank you. Hi, Soledad and hi, Rose. Thank you so much for coming. Um, It's great to have you here. Some of my questions have been answered, but I am a a professor in the journalism department with Janet, and I'm interested in entrepreneurial journalism and different business models because I came from the print side. Um, A lot of my colleagues, I'm a photojournalist, a lot of my colleagues had been um, downsized and then whole photo departments, you know, disappeared. But a colleague at another institution and I are talking about (coughs) the ways in which we can encourage young journalism students to look for the local stories in their communities, because not everybody's going to have a staff job like we all did, you know, coming Mm -hmm. out of um, coming out of undergrad. And what types of advice would you give to students who might have to go back and live with their parents? Mm -hmm. Um, what can we do to uh, get them motivated that this is like the next coming? Because we did see an uptick in local news due to COVID. So how can we keep that momentum going? And then, um, you know, rah-rah our students to, to let them know that this, this is vital and important. Such a great question. And when I started my company, which was now eight years ago, um, which is so crazy because it feels like it was a blink of an eye, you know, we had to start thinking about how do we do journalism, but also run a company with 13 full-time employees who need to get paid in exactly. U.S. dollars, right? <laughs> you know, like this is not a charity event. Everybody wants to get a paycheck. And that meant a fair amount of overhead, et cetera, et cetera. And so uh, I'll let Rose jump in because she's done a lot of thinking about partnerships because she really oversees all of our journalism work. But I would say for me, it was it, it took about probably less than a year to start thinking about financing it first, right? Often we love to create a thing and then try to find someone to buy it. And we flipped that pretty quickly and realized we had to go find partners to finance something. And not everybody's a good partner. Some people have very specific wants and needs, but there are a lot of interesting partners. And how do you create something and bring together platforms and elevate all of those things? But really it is, you know, how do we make money off of this? You, You have to think that way. Because otherwise you lose money very quickly and then the entire thing goes away. And it should not be a charitable endeavor. It should be, we have a project, we're getting paid and we do work for money. I I used to tell my staff all the time, anybody who wants to volunteer for something is welcome to on their own time for whatever they want to do. Like, I will never ask you to not get paid for a project. If I want to volunteer for something, that's cool. But like, I won't make you not get paid on a, we, we don't, we're not, we're not doing charity work for what we're doing in our company. And I think that that, frame of mind, first and foremost, is very important. Yeah, and I'd say for young people, uh, Gina, there are, are two things. First, if, if you're moving back in with your parents, say thank you, because that sounds like a really tough Amazing. situation. Yes. <laughs> you know, if they're retirees, say thank you twice. Um, I'd say that when you're starting out, uh, because I, I think you're talking also a lot about entry-level people, um, it's important to get yourself out there and to get that resume built and to get those stories done so that the next level of person who's gonna pay you more money and get you more readers or viewers and is gonna to wanna to mentor you or whatever has something to look at. That sometimes means that, you know, you certainly shouldn't be working for free, but right for a penny, you know, right for the, the, literally the penny saver in your hometown, go to the town meeting and write something for the local whatever website for that, you know, that thing that, that only 10 people read, but maybe 20 people will read tomorrow. 
go to organ news organizations and say, do you take stringers? Everybody loves freelancers these day, be, days because they can pay them less. Do a couple of freelance stories, follow people around. Um, I think the way that you get young people excited about journalism is to have them do journalism because journalism is an exciting profession. Yes. It's really cool to go out and cover a local story and have your neighbor know that you covered that story. It's really cool to uncover something and have actual change happen because of something that you reported. So, you know, don't sit around and wait for a platform or a job uh, to be able to do what you're doing. Make them go out and continue to do stories. And, you know, sometimes they can do a story, it's just for their college newspaper, but that's a big deal that gets you to the next step. And you can take that story to a bigger paper and say, look, I've done a story that you haven't done. Why don't you guys do it too? Or why don't you have me do it? Or why don't you let me help your reporter do it? I'm going to say we've got one more thank question. Thank you so much. And thank you, Pleasure. Gina. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to cut cut you off there. I, you know. <laughs> so our last question will be coming from um, Colleen Bradley MacArthur, and uh, so we get and so because I think it's a really it is an emotional question. Hey there. Thanks so much, Janet. I am actually. I was in the broadcast journalism program at Emerson back in 2001, and I worked for local news for a number of years, and now I'm out of journalism, but I'm a huge fan of the profession, obviously, and have been watching the evolution over the last year of the stories that reporters have to tell that are so emotionally charged from a number of angles. You know, we've had to deal with so much this past year. And then you see reporters having emotional reactions to either covering multiple funerals uh, for one family. Uh, I think that was one woman out um, in California. And, you know, I'm in awe because I'm like, wow, we're, you're allowed to be human. But then I always go back <laughs> to remembering my training, which is, you know, you, you don't, journalists don't do that, right? And so uh, we have to stay impartial. But I, I'm wondering if the pandemic, if you, if you guys uh, and, and uh, women think that this is going to uh, change things. Uh, I don't think it's a pandemic. I always thought that it was a mistake to think that people couldn't have human reactions. I remember watching some journalists who'd be like, Right behind me, there's a dead body. You're like, whoa, 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 what? Like, no. I, I, so I, I honestly think that's one of those rules that we could just lose. I, I wanna see people emotionally affected by something terrible, if that's how they're feeling. I, I don't mind it. I do think I've always tried to keep front and center that I don't want my emotions. I'll tell you a funny story. I should not tell the story, but I'm going to, but I'm gonna try to keep people's names out of it. I was covering a story once and a reporter was on the scene uh, of JFK Jr.'s plane crash. And we came to her, to tell us what's happening. And she literally had had a hard time finding a parking spot. And for four minutes, she ranted about how crazy busy the island was and how she couldn't find a parking spot and there was no hotels to stay. I mean, it was the craziest thing. Um, that's all the detail I'm gonna give you. Uh, but right, it's because what was wrong about it was she centered her own emotion versus sort of letting her emotion open a window to what was happening. Nobody cares about the parking when they're talking about this horrific death of a young man who was very popular and well-known. And so I think it's to me, so that really taught me a lesson watching that unfold of like, keep yourself out of it. Try to make sure that your emotions aren't overwhelming the story uh, and you're not not emotional but that you're holding it in check so that you're, you know, you're helping in the storytelling that you're appropriate, I guess, is the way I would do it. So I, I've never had, I've cried through stories. I've, and, and I'm okay with that. You know, I just think I've also been very lucky to work with producers who shoot that in a very, this is not a story about Soledad crime. Like this is a little tiny piece of it. And now, but the story is about this thing over here. And I think that's a lot about how you just, you don't think of it as acting and you don't think of it as a stage. You're just in the middle of a story. And if your drama and your own personal thing is undermining or dragging away from somebody else's story, you're really doing it 
wrong. You should be helping elevate that person's story. And sometimes those stories are just, I mean, covering the tsunami where there are just bodies everywhere. It was very hard to not be affected by that, you know, but overtly weeping in the middle of something would have, would have been ridiculous. It would have been a focus on me and, and, yeah. and it was, this focus wasn't me. So, you know, watching somebody really spend four minutes complaining about not being able to find a parking spot for a funeral was a crazy town. And uh, it really taught me the lesson of never, ever do that. But talk about the emotions that you're feeling and how it feels uh, and make sure that you're um, helping people feel that as well. I believe that as long as it's genuine. I mean, I think, you know, if you are moved by something. The viewers probably moved by that too. And I think it's perfectly natural for you to feel the way you feel. What isn't right is to cry on TV on purpose or to be fake mad or to be fake sad or to be, you know, fake frustrated or, you know, and there's this whole thing that has arisen. And I think it sort of started after September 11th when you had some reporters who broke down and there was all this debate about, oh, was that okay or was that not okay? And suddenly it was okay and it was so okay that it was like ratings grabbing and oh, it's cool our reporter cried. You'll see regularly now, if you look on CNN and MSNBC in particular, they have stories literally every week about their reporters' emotional outbursts. You know, see Brooke Baldwin get upset with blah, blah, blah. See blah, 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 dress down, blah, blah, blah. You know blah, 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 in tears because of, of this. And it's, it's they're showing of their advertising, their reporters, like in many cases, sort of fake crying. You know, the COVID stuff I thought was just horrible. It's like a lot of people, these reporters getting COVID. And it's like, here I am reporting live from my room, <coughs> cough, cough. And, you know, I'm scared for my life. And I was, I'm not saying that they weren't, but the dramatization was just so over the top sometimes that it didn't feel authentic. It felt and like- you know, go ahead. And a good point is also make sure you have a good teammate, right? Because honestly, you need sometimes people to call you out on that and say, yeah. you know, like nobody cares about your parking issues. And I get it. You've gone down the rabbit hole of you're upset, but like nobody cares and bring it back over to what we're supposed to be covering. I think that's why you have teams who do these things. Whoa, this has been, we've covered, bless you. I think I heard someone sneeze. Bless you. Um, thank. Oh my gosh. I want to first of all thank our audience, but more and thank Soledad and Rose. Oh my gosh. I felt this was really great. We talked a lot of stuff and we, quite honestly, we were very upfront and honest. And that's, I think, where we need to be. I want to thank everyone. I also want to say, we're going to put up on the screen here links to get you to the full stories of Shingle Mountain, Mermaid City, Hungry to Learn. There's all kinds of great stories. The, the series on BET, Disrupt and, um, Disrupt and Dismantle, you just look on that. There's a lot of great links. It's fabulous. And I'm also going to say that I know Soledad and Rose, we're going to, I'm going to, we're going to keep in touch so that we can promote and it. let people know what you're up to. Cause you know, just for an FYI, for those who may have not known is that Soledad was our commencement speaker in 2019. And so back when we used the, to do those things live and took, yeah. we took off 2020 for that. So I would like to say this is the start of a, of, of a, of a beautiful relationship here. We love so it. We love thank it. You thank you. Thank you for having us. Much. Really appreciate it. Thank you so much. Nice to thank chat you. with everybody. All righty. Take um, care, everyone. Thank you.